Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, our weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, lost in translation. The end of the 20th century wasn't good for Japan. They called it the lost decade. Now, poverty and suicide take their toll again on a weak economy. Also, the Kabul banks of potentially shady deals come to light, leading to a run on people's money in Afghanistan. And does the punishment fit the crime? Three bounced checks puts a man in jail in Dubai. The family says it's just too harsh. But first to something we touched on last week in our economic whiz around the world, Japan. It is a proud nation. It had a strong economy, but now it's facing multiple threats with little end in sight. First, the yen, the currency now at a 15-year high against the dollar, crippling exports. Second, the politics, that's five prime ministers in four years, and the current one, true to form, facing a challenge to his leadership. And third, the poverty. The rates doubled since the property and stock markets collapsed in the early 90s, and 16% of the population, which is around 20 million people, are now said to live in poverty. Will the economic sun rise again over Japan? We'll discuss that in a moment after this report from Divya Gopalan in Tokyo. Every afternoon, the homeless take over the Shinjuku Chua Park as charity workers hand out food. It's been two decades since Japan's economic bubble burst, and the statistics paint a grim picture. Nearly one in six Japanese now live below the poverty line. But you won't see some of the worst off here. The crowd is distinctly male. Stigma prevents the growing number of destitute single mothers from joining the queue. Like Natsume, who is struggling to provide for her son, she didn't want to appear on camera. If it's something happening to a normal family, people accept it as a family issue. But if it's a single parent family, they always blame the mother. That is the hardest thing for me. Natsume endured years of violent domestic abuse before she escaped with her son. He struck me on my face, injured my nose. I ran to the police with my son in my arms. When I went to them, they said it was just a fight between husband and wife. A recent cabinet survey found a third of women are physically and mentally abused by their husbands. Only a handful ever go to the police, and there aren't many charities to turn to either. Mother Festum, the group that helped Natsume, is one of the few. Its 30 volunteers give single mothers advice on how to adjust to life on their own and find jobs. After divorce, their situation was completely changed suddenly. They have no idea how to live as a single man. Unfortunately, the local government do not show, you know, there is uh, information or some help. But it is quite tough. The thing about poverty in Japan is that it's very much beneath the surface. On the streets of Tokyo, there are few visible signs that a growing number of people are living below the poverty line. The government is starting to acknowledge that it is a problem, but it's accused of overlooking the most vulnerable group, single mothers. Politician Yoriko Madoka is trying to get the government to address the plight of one-parent families, but with little success. I have been working on single mother issues for over 30 years. I have also dealt with child poverty and worked for mothers to be able to have a job and earn a decent salary. But Japan always focuses on the average people's issues only. Women's problems have always been left out. As Japan struggles to revive its economy, the government is now waking up to the fact that the poor are falling through the cracks. But in Japan's male-dominated society, little is being done to help those that feel the economic pain the hardest, the women and the children. Now, it's not to say Japan's government's doing nothing, at least economically speaking. On Friday, it announced an almost $11 billion stimulus package, though the immediate reaction was that that amount was still too small. Let's talk to Sujiro Takashita now, director of Japanese financial giant Mizuho International. March 2004, I think, was the last time Japan actually mm. intervened in the currency mm. market. Why hold back this time when it's at a 15-year high and, as you say, it's, it's killing the country's exports? That's true. The frustration by the Japanese corporates are mounting uh, enormously, and they're taking it into action. You can see this by the fact that, for example, Nissan has transferred their micro base in Thailand, Suzuki's likely to do the same, and even Panasonic. Uh, however, uh, I think the intervention is quite unlikely uh, at this moment, at least uh, not in the immediate term. The reason is the last time they made an intervention, they had a help, or at least a verbal agreement from the United States. This time, they will.
will not. And at the same time, there's a political, uh, I think, mishmash that's going on right now. We've got the DPJ election coming up next Tuesday. And therefore, I think most of the people will be at a standby, even the Bank of Japan or Minister of Finance. You mentioned the elections there, the ruling uh, DPJ party precisely. Would political mm. stability, and I guess by that I mean not having five prime ministers in four years, would that have made a huge difference to Japan at this point? <laughs> Do you think it would be in the situation it is currently in, had it actually had some real political stability? Exactly. What we should have done is made a painful, short-term painful, but long-term gain type of uh, transformation policies ages ago. But we've refused to do that, basically. And unfortunately, the politics we've got right now is, well, we have a Japanese saying, going is hell and going back is hell as well. That's exactly the choice that we've got. And unfortunately, uh, be it Mr. Ozawa or Mr. Mr. Khan, who will continue with his prime ministership, either way, it's going to be very negative. It's going to be two steps or four steps back for the Japanese economy because of lack of decisiveness to take these painful actions and basically stood by in what I call a sugar ca candy coated giving these uh, vested interest type of policies which really doesn't have a very good multiply to the economy and unfortunately they because they've stuck to these kind of policies uh, we have basically been too lazy to make that transformation and therefore we are paying the price because of lack of transformation ie uh, restructuring that should have taken place Okay, let's just uh, switch focus for a moment, Sujiro. I want to look at China, actually. It's got around $2.5 trillion sitting around doing not mm. much at the moment. And now deciding to buy up Japanese mm. bonds. Do we take that as a sign of confidence, or is it just China wanting mm -hmm. to spend mm. its money somewhere? Well, it's very difficult to assess the minds of that government, but uh, basically it is quite true. It's becoming one of the biggest forces of the strengthening factor, and of course it does do good to their export side. That is very, very true. But at the same time, I don't think it is in their strategic interest. A lot of that is very much a short-term money. Of course, if it transcends into the long-term side, then uh, I think there will be talks about you know national securities etc that would come about but at this point I don't think it is uh, that much of a big trend uh, in the short run of course we are seeing them as a biggest well pressure uh, f especially for the uh, the buyers on the end okay final thought from you uh, Sergio it's more of a, a social question related to our earlier report uh, or the way Japanese society affects the economy mm. there is a number which says suicide and depression mm will cost Japan around $20 billion in lost economic output. Mm. Now, you know, it might be a bit callous to mm. put a number, mm. financial number on mm. suicide and depression, but it is a huge issue in Japan. Mm. Does it go right mm. to the heart of Japan's economic malaise mm. at the moment? Mm. Very much so. It's all correlated. In fact, I keep saying this, but Japan is the only country in the world where you find jobless, jobless rate and suicide it is correlated. It's a societal phenomenon where, um, uh, where you see a very strong rigidity in job replacement in Japan and also social face loss that's associated with it. Again, it goes back to the fact that because the government were too lazy to make that transformation, which is basically, uh, I would say, construct destruction of conventional methodologies of employment or human resource management and induce more employment. They didn't do that. Uh, they refused to do that. And unfortunately, um, that has resulted in uh, having the re-employment status be extremely difficult in Japan. So basically, yes, it's all related, uh, in fact. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why Mr. Khan, our current prime minister, his number one target is to create employment. And I do think this is painful in the short run, but very gainful in the long run. Now, it's easy and said done. The problem with him is that he has not really come up with any concrete measures which convinces the market. Sejiro Takashita there, thank you very much for your time and for your insight. Now to a company we've covered extensively here on Counting the Cost, BP, which has been, like an oil slick, spreading. The blame, that is, for the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion back in April. You know the story by now, 11 workers tragically killed, the rig sank and for months the oil flowed leading to the worst oil spill in US history. In its internal report, BP does accept some responsibility but also claims it had partners in its crime. Jonah Hull has more. BP's internal inquiry into the Deepwater Horizon disaster accepts some blame but not all for the events that led to the worst offshore oil spill in US history. The 200-page report seeks to back up BP's insistence that no single factor was responsible. 
but rather a complex and interlinked series of mechanical failures, human judgments, engineering design, came together to allow the initiation and escalation of the accident. Among its conclusions, the report admits mistakes made by BP employees, including misinterpreting crucial pressure warnings in the hours before the explosion. But it also points at the failings of others, like the rig's owner, Swiss-based Transocean, responsible for crucial safety equipment designed to seal the well as soon as the leak began, and Halliburton, the US company that attached the wellhead to the sea floor, is criticized for weaknesses in cement design and testing. Nobody in, in America, I suspect, really wants to believe that anybody apart from BP is to blame. Um, and of course, this is a self-serving report. It has to be a self-serving report. It has no legal weight. This is BP putting the best possible case for itself. Key to BP's ultimate culpability are charges by some critics of gross negligence, something the company hopes its report will refute. BP is on tricky ground in seeking to share the blame. The best case scenario is that the focus of ongoing investigations, including one by the US Justice Department, shifts towards the failings of others. Worst case scenario, though, is that that doesn't happen and that instead BP, already deeply unpopular in the United States, is seen simply as shirking its responsibility. When counting the cost returns, Kabul Bank, just where did those hundreds of millions of dollars mysteriously go? And prisons are filling up in Dubai. We're going to take a look at debt in the Middle East and how a bounced check could lead to much more than just a bad credit rating. Welcome back to Counting the Cost, your weekly business stop right here on Al Jazeera. Corruption, nepotism, financial mismanagement, that was the apparent story coming out of the Afghan capital, all in relation to the country's largest private lender, Kabul Bank. Story goes that the bank's chairman and CEO, who own 56% of the bank between them, have been using its money to buy up luxury property in Dubai. The reaction was twofold. Afghanistan's central bank froze uh, some of the bank's assets, while Afghans themselves rushed to the bank to try to get their money out. Well, I'm pleased to say joining us here in the studio is a man who knows Kabul and Afghanistan very well, James Bays, a long-time uh, Afghanistan correspondent for us here at Al Jazeera. James, thank you for coming in. I, I said the words, their largest private lender, yet it seems there are government fingerprints or links to government all over the place. Is that just how it works in Afghanistan? Well, many big businesses in Afghanistan have shareholders who are linked uh, with the government. I suppose that's quite common uh, in a country like Afghanistan where we have uh, conflict been going on for a long time and uh, uh, the Karzai government in place now for nine years. They really were starting with a blank sheet of paper when Karzai uh, came to power uh, and many of those who invested uh, in the big businesses and in the banks were those who were close to the government elite. Mm. What they did was freeze assets and then tell everyone, oh, it's all okay. Didn't work. There was a huge run on the bank. Why was there so little confidence in what was being told to them? Well, I think people in Afghanistan don't have a lot of confidence in what they're told by the government on a range of issues. And I think this is really damaging. There's a real cruel irony here that the customers of Kabul Bank, are, many of them, are the most loyal foot soldiers of the Karzai government. They're the policemen, they're the army officers, they're the civil servants who are the key people keeping the country running. And many of them now are beginning to lose confidence, not just in this bank, but in the government they serve. So I think it has uh, wider repercussions, very worrying ones, uh, for the situation in Afghanistan. Well, you say wider, let's go wider, let's go to Dubai, because there's a, there's a link here, the, the, the chairman and the CEO, apparently they've been buying up luxury properties in Dubai. What is the connection between Afghanistan and Dubai these days? Well, Dubai is where rich Afghans spend their money. Uh, they either spend it in Pakistan or in the UAE, but the UAE is the favoured destination because it's easy for an Afghan with money to get a visa. They'll get it in just a, just a few hours, or if they, um, it's difficult for them to get a visa, they just have to put down a bond and then they're able to get that visa. There are flights uh, several times a day to Dubai. So it's where 
uh, money is invested by rich Afghans. They often say in criminal cases, follow the money. Now, diplomats mm. tell me if you were to get to the bottom of the corruption in Afghanistan, the funding uh, of the Taliban, uh, the kidnapping, the drugs trade, they say much of that money passes through Dubai. Uh, Western diplomats telling me they can't get access to those bank records. The Dubai authority is very secretive, but if they could, they reckon they could track down many of those uh, involved in, in, in these different areas. Hence why, as you say, people don't have confidence in their government because all, all this money in Afghanistan, it's not coming to them, it's all heading out the country, out the back door. Yeah, yeah, they believe that the amount of money leaving Afghanistan just from Kabul airport in cash is a billion dollars a year. That's the estimate. There's nothing illegal about taking money out of uh, Afghanistan. VIPs are able to take money out in suitcases. They're not even searched the VIP terminal of Kabul airport. The Americans have now insisted that there are money counting machines uh, put uh, into the airport uh, at Kabul. Uh, and the reason for this is they are concerned that some of this money is money that's just being given out uh, in Afghanistan for reconstruction projects. Very often, commanders on the ground actually have uh, wads of dollars which mm. they give out to local tribes they fear that some of this money is going straight out of the country in suitcases that's why they've got these money counting machines which are going to register the serial numbers of the bills to make sure that money that's just been given by Western governments isn't going straight out of the country uh, to uh, fund villas uh, in Dubai absolutely extraordinary James thank you for coming great talking to you uh, more banking woes now. This time it's the growing pile of defaulting checks, bounce checks we call them. Uh, this is happening in Dubai. And the expats finding themselves behind bars as a result. Get this number, around 5,000 checks are bouncing every single week in the Emirate. And the kicker is that in Dubai it's considered a criminal offence. Now the story of one British developer in jail has thrust the issue back into the spotlight. Dan Nolan takes up that story. The Karashi children are perhaps the youngest Dubai residents wanting urgent reform to the United Arab Emirates bounce check laws. 11-year-old Sara posted a YouTube video three months ago pleading for Dubai's ruler to ask a court to review the evidence that saw her father, Safi Karashi, sentenced to seven years in jail. Please can you help me get justice for my dad because I know he is innocent. Now the campaign has switched to Karashi's native England with a small demonstration outside the UAE embassy in London. His supporters pleading for him to be pardoned during the Eid holiday marking the end of Ramadan. Safi Karashi, along with a business partner and financial controller from his Dubai property company, were all jailed in January after three security checks worth $53 million bounced last year. His wife Huma says none of the checks should have ever been cashed claiming two of them had only one signature instead of the required two, while a third check was stolen. My husband's company stopped that check and reported it as stolen at one of the police stations. So all three checks, all the cases that he's in for, he shouldn't be in there. He's innocent. But banking law experts explain that in Dubai, judges are not always required to consider the intent or circumstances of such cases. The judge will ask the uh, defendant uh, whether uh, the cheque been issued by him or not, uh, whether the signature on the cheque is it's his signature or not, and will issue the judgment. That's all they need to prove. Exactly. Now, Safi's case is by no means rare. In 2007, four in ten inmates in Dubai Central Prison were there because of debt. Police haven't said what that number is now, post-Dubai crisis. But from the rows of luxury cars abandoned at Dubai Airport, it's pretty clear the tax-free dream has turned sour for many. So it's far from a game, but here's how it played out. Pre-crisis, confidence was bolstered by record oil prices and salaries were soaring because of it when oil was up at $147 a barrel. By 2007, disposable incomes for men in the UAE had more than doubled from 1995. For women, shot up 85%. But here's the flip side. Between 2003 and 2008, credit card debt quadrupled to $7.8 billion. There was easy credit. There was a building boom. It was a five-year spending frenzy which of course fell over spectacularly as the 2008 global downturn hit. Thousands of uh, construction workers, many from the subcontinent, downed tools. While for some Western expatriates, the choice was either face jail time for defaulting on loans or leave the car at the airport and run. 
which as many as 2,500 a month were doing, according to one bank's estimate. It was a gamble and one which may not end up paying off too. Some UK firms are actually buying up the bad debts and hunting down defaulters there. Joining me now, Yasir Khan, who is a lawyer with the group detained in Dubai, also the cousin of Safi Qureshi, who we saw in that report. Yasir, many layers, I guess, to this story. I want to start, though, with the idea of jail, because a lot of people looking at this might think, yes, a bounce check, it is a major problem, but is it worthy of going to jail? Yeah, e exactly. In, it, in, in of itself, a bounce check it amounts to theft. I mean, you're, you're trying to purchase something, whether that be a service or product, knowing full well that you're not going to pay for it. But then it comes back down to the intent of that. Did the person intend to do that? Or was there some fraud upon the other person in banking that check in the first place, which is the case of Safi Qureshi? Um, and, and like you said, rightly so, if someone is trying to defraud someone by issuing a balance check, then, then they need to be punished accordingly. But the intent needs to be understood before, beforehand, before any punishment can be given, to understand who really is the victim and who is the criminal in, in, in this case, as we can see that those roles have been reversed. Yeah, but, you know, we've, we've got a situation in Dubai at the moment where the economy has suffered, people are defaulting, they're struggling with debt, some even jumping the country trying to get out as quickly as they can. You're talking about intent. Even if the intent's not there, if you're defaulting, you're defaulting. And if you're going to come and do business in Dubai, then that's the law. Uh, of, of course, that, 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 that is the law that they've got. But what we're asking for, what, what needs to happen is there needs to be some sort of a reform. Because, as you said, if someone is defaulting um, and they've defaulted, say, one monthly payment, as you said, because they may have you know, now lost their job, then surely it should be, they should be given some time, some respite to sort of pay that one monthly payment. Let's look more widely at issues in a place like Dubai where the economic downfall was so spectacular, so public. Um, but, you know, it goes beyond construction slowdowns and credit ratings and, and bailouts from Abu Dhabi. At the core of it, this is about people, people who can't pay their debts, they get in over their heads, and in some cases, as we pointed out, I, I hate keep going back to this, but they do, they skip the country, leave the car at the airport and go. Yeah, that's, that's the choices that a lot of people have been left with because you've missed a payment or you found out that you, you now lo no longer have a job or your, your company has now become bankrupt. You may have car payments, mortgage payments, and the two choices, unfortunately, that people are left with is we either leave the country and return back to our native country or we, we could potentially go to jail for four to five years, as has been the case of Safi Qureshi. But in, in Safi Qureshi's case, he, 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 di he, didn't, he didn't leave the country because he knew from beginning to end and to this day that he was innocent and that the checks that he had actually signed were not meant to be banked. And actually one of the checks had been, had been cancelled by the police themselves. They, they were fully aware of this. It had been notified that this check had been stolen. And he remained in the country and, and he's now subsequently you know, paying the penalty for, for that, for his honesty. Yes, the account there in London. Thank you very much for your time. Before we leave you, a quick look at counting the cost online, part of the revamped Al Jazeera.net forward slash English. You head there as usual, click on the business tab at the top. That'll point you in the direction of the CTC page. I'll pop a weekly blog up there along with links to the latest business headlines. Still tweeting as well. No changes there. At AJ Counting Cost, the name to look for. Send me some thoughts if you like, ideas for the show. I'll send you some thoughts of mine as well. Good way to keep in touch with the show with us on Twitter. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.